So first and foremost, since I think I have um, audience which are who are scientists or engineers, so let's start with um, some problem statements, you no? Know, because that would um, excite us. It would um, interest us to understand how does it go. So the first problem statement for insurance would be that if I look at the insurance industry in India and typically across the world, you no. Know, uh, the beauty is that the combined ratio, so let me explain what a combined ratio would mean. Combined ratio would be that for let's say 100 rupees of premium taken, which is the input, the outgo would be, uh, uh, let's say claims, manual expenses and commission. So the ratio of these two is called combined ratio. If the combined ratio is 100, which means the industry is not making money and they can make some through uh, investment, but that would be a lower amount. So we look at the Indian industry for the past decade or so, more than a decade, the combined ratio has been hovering between 115 to 120%, which means for every 100 rupees that the industry has taken, you know, the outgo has been about 115 to 120. Good. Now that is fine, but the problem statement does not lie here. It lies in the other part of it. If we take an opinion and we ask people, what do they think of insurance industry as a whole? And that is where the funny part starts. You know? They would say the insurance industry does not pay claims. Now, is it not very funny to realize that the industry is bleeding to death paying claims you know, with a combined ratio, which is at 115 to 120%. And the majority of population, by majority, I would say that if I ask, let's say 100 people, 98, 99% would have a view that the industry does not pay claims. Now that is a funny statement no, to have. Uh, so let's, let's park this uh, problem statement. That one, the industry is dying paying claims while the general public at large feels the industry does not pay claims. So why does this happen? No, that's one statement. The second problem statement would be, now if I look at it, no, let's, let's see, we have uh, COVID going on now. Uh, the industry came out with a cover for COVID, a health cover, at a price point which would be less than, let's say, three rupees a day, you know, which would give you a cover up to, let's say, two lakh rupees. Uh, and that is the average claim size for COVID. Uh, phenomenal uh, product, I would say, and a phenomenal price, you know. Uh, average claim cost, one and a half, two lakh rupees. Anybody can get COVID. Nobody can say that they will not get COVID. It's a pandemic and you have insurance companies offering this. It's available on all websites. You can check any insurance company website. You'll find this uh, cover available. Now, which actually means that if I look at the Indian population, which is close to, let's say, one, uh, uh, one, one lakh, 130 crore, out of which uh, government will be covering, let's say, 40 crore, and uh, corporates would be covering about 10, 20, which means 70 crore people would not be covered by insurance at high risk. And the price point of uh, three rupees a day, um, I think the 70 crores I'm talking about, everybody could afford, or let's say, even I cut down to make it realistic, let's say we say 40 crore people afford. So 40 crore people don't have a cover, very easily available, available on all insurance websites, all agents would be you no know, having it. The insurance company website should be crashing. Because amazing product, anybody can get COVID, huge awareness levels, you no? Know? But that's not the case. In fact, in the month of April, the growth of health premium of the Indian industry was at minus 3%. No? It picked up, it uh, reached to a double digit, no? at about 30% or so, but that's insignificant compared to the population, uh, which is uncovered and your product, no underwriting um, uh, problem. No, anybody can be covered 15 days from the time you take the policy, the cover kicks off, no? uh, one click, uh, one click uh, purchase, as, as simple as that. Whatever you think of for ease of buying or you think of, no. Um, in terms of uh, product uh, configuration, or you can think of uh, um, the price point, or you can think of awareness level, all there. But is insurance company server crashing? The answer is no. That's the second problem statement. No? Now, if I look at, let's try and analyze these two first, no, and then uh, we'll move on to make it more interesting. So let me come back to the first problem statement. I said, industry please to death paying claims, 
And the perception of the public at large is that the industry is not paying claims. And this is not like an Indian perception you're talking about. It's across the world. So you can actually walk into any part of the world and ask, what do you feel about insurance companies? And get the answers, ah, they don't pay claims. In fact, you heard when COVID happened, in the US, you know, uh, it was headlines like, you no, know, the insurance companies are not paying um, COVID uh, business interruption claims. You know? It was, in fact, the president of US was himself mentioning about uh, whether the claim should be payable or not payable. You know? That was a discussion at that kind of level, which was there. So it's across the world. In fact, that reminds me of a joke when we set up this company, Bajaj Alliance, in the year 2001. And I was speaking to one of my German uh, colleagues uh, from Allianz and telling him that in India, the impression of insurance companies is not so good. No, in fact, uh, the joke goes that uh, if you are good for nothing, you join an insurance company. So my German friend, he laughed. He said, no, no, in Germany it's better. So it's like this, that um, if you are um, good for nothing, you fail in everything, you become a bartender. And when you fail as a bartender, you join an insurance company. I think that is the kind of perception which is there. But it's a funny perception, no? Um, billions of dollars get paid at claims, you know? across the world, why do people feel so? So I was thinking about this, I'm a scientist by education, so obviously nothing, no, is it a problem statement, I would love to go deeper and figure out what, what could be the reason why it is so. So when I go back to the history of uh, creation of insurance industry, let's say if I take you to the 16th century, you know, at that point time, how, what is the purpose? Uh, you collect money from many to pay to a few, you know, whoever claim or an unfortunate incident as defined by the contract which has been signed. That is what insurance does. Now the onus is on the insurance industry to ensure that fraudulent people don't take money because they are custodian of public money which has been given to them that if things go wrong, they pay to the people for whom things have gone wrong. So the process of insurance company is that the moment somebody lodges a claim, they see it with a scrutiny that if things can be wrong, so the entire process of elimination is by starting that the claimant is a fraud and eliminating one by one till they're convinced that it's an honest claim and then they pay. Fair enough, I think that's what they should do. That's public money, custodian of public money. That is what they should do in a very reasonable manner. Now you look at the customer. He has paid money in trust to insurance company that if things go wrong, they will pay. He is a genuine customer. He walks in, lodges a claim. And the insurance company treats him like a fraudster and they start eliminating fraud before they pay. Terrible customer experience. And this is precisely why, if you look at across the world, you have this perception that insurance companies don't want to pay claims, which in reality is not the case. Because if we look at data, data shows insurance companies are paying claims like crazy. And how do we solve this problem? No, problem is fine, but how do we solve this problem is the next uh, step that we should be thinking about. The solution to the problem is that the experience for customer should be so seamless when he or she lodges the claim that the belief should be the insurance company is very eager to pay claims. Fair enough. But then what about the fraud part of it? Yes, that is where the tech comes into picture. Now, let's say we go to 16th century, it was difficult to ascertain that till you send a a surveyor, a, a person down to have a look at it and then click pictures, then you bring it to office, then you have discussions, then you want um, different data points and the survey goes again, then questions, then again he comes back, then again he goes to customer questions, no? It was a to and fro happening. That was fine for 16th century. But in today's time, why do we, most legacy company, still do it? No. And that is where tech plays an amazing role. No? Let's say if I look at our company as Brazilians, about five years back, we said we'll pay automobile claims in 10 minutes time. Uh, all the customers to do is click pictures. Every mobile has a camera today, no? Click pictures, upload, no? And we use all the pictures that we have from the database. We figure out the spot, no? And figure out what is the quantum of a claim like that which has been settled earlier and make an offer to the customer within 10 minutes time. If the customer says, yes, we transfer money to his bank account. That time when we thought about it, uh, people said, yeah, it will be difficult. How do we do that? No, and this thought was not across the world to a very large extent. Today, quite a few companies talk about it. And we didn't have also artificial intelligence and machine learning to such a huge um, uh, kind of uh, position which it is today. So we actually put um, automobile engineers, good ones, you no. Know, behind the scenes with pictures that come, the matching would happen with the database and it would be thrown up 
and the automobile engineer get a rough idea as to what the amount is and you would uh, take a judgment you know based on the data which comes through and then you would uh, get the customer to be called and make an uh, offer and settlement today the machine learning ai uh, baked into it this process becomes super fast now from a customer perspective if i take you back to the year 2000 not many years back just about 20 years back uh, in our own country if you had a car claim you actually had you would be very happy if you got a car claim paid in about two months time you know the process was like this that you intimate to your insuring branch uh, wherever it is not uh, and then you get a survey uh, deputed a uh, surveyor would come down have a look at your vehicle he would be like the preliminary surveyor go back then your when your vehicle gets dismantled as it gets dismantled over time you again have surveyor then when the vehicle gets completed you again have a surveyor a different one pictures would get uploaded to the insurance company then they would make an assessment then you have to bring all the salvage part, right? From bumper to headlight to the insurance company's office. They would actually deposit it and take one by one to see that those matches with the picture which was taken by surveys earlier to eliminate fraud, as I told you. And then the claims would get paid. So a customer was very happy if you would get an insurance claim off his automobile in two and a half to three months' time. And today we talk of 10 minutes' time. No? So the problem statement of getting trust of customers while insurance companies maintain that the public money does not go to fraudulent hands is a combination of using artificial intelligence or machine learning and external data, putting it together, all the profiling that you guys are aware about, you heard about so much now, no customer profiling, using social media accounts, all that access that you can get, figuring out whether this will be a fraud or is this right, in microseconds and giving a straight through experience to the customer is what is going to redefine the industry and solve the problem which has been there in the industry for close to 400, 500 years. You know? And that will happen across the world. So industry, this is where the big challenge and the big fun is, how do you, all the claim processes make it that it should not last more than a couple of minutes time, you know? And how do you bake in the data from all external parts? How do you bake in the tech, the machine learning, the AI to ensure they can deliver at such hyperspeed because that is the time when the customer says insurance is good and they pay claims. Now, that was the first problem statement I mentioned to you. The second problem statement I mentioned to you is, and I give you an example of this um, COVID uh, cover, now Corona cover available at a price point which is less than three rupees a day, you know, uninsured population, every insurance company website has this um, cover. You can log in anywhere and buy when you want. Anybody can get COVID, no underwriting, anybody can buy this cover. Phenomenal, like whatever you think of ease of purchase, uh, no hassle, no underwriting, everything is there. Still, why is it that the insurance company servers are not crashing? Now, now this is the second point, which is very interesting. And this also links to the fact that if I look at when every industry talks about, they talk of de-intimidation, they talk of direct to customers. In fact, uh, quite a few tech, uh, insure tech startups have actually started working on direct to customers, getting a profiling of the customers, you know, straight to very uh, good UI, UX, uh, very convenient. But still, uh, did they make a big dent in terms of market? Now, if I look at it, the answer is still no. It's mostly bundled into different kinds of activities. Uh, which would be where they would be there. And we heard our previous speaker also speak about how it will become embedded in most of the other processes. But the pure insurance sale, the product is good. The price point is phenomenal. Anybody can fall ill and gives a good cover. No underwriting, single click, still. Why does it not sell like crazy? You know? The answer here is again very interesting. The answer is that our human brain is not wired to see risks at that magnitude. No, it's good also because it was wired like that. We are not left uh, caves. You know, we'd still be staying in caves or, uh, or you know, just hiding somewhere. Uh, so afraid of what could happen if things go wrong. So fundamentally, if I look at uh, this problem statement, the issue is that insurance to be sold in a de-intermediated manner on a straight single product, the way you would buy a phone or the way you would buy an automobile or the way you may buy an apparel or a fancy good, is not something that's gonna happen because I get to see an individual who's super excited in the morning and says, wow, today I'll buy insurance. Okay, <coughs> pandemic is on, I should get a cover, I'll buy it right now today. I've yet to meet a person like that, you know. 
But if somebody has a conversation, then the sale happens. Because then people realize, yeah, it's a risk. Oh, I didn't know that. Can I buy at this kind of price point? Oh, is all insurance companies offering it? The single click buy, is it? Phenomenal. And then the sale happens. <laughs> so insurance remains a conversational sale. Now if insurance remains a conversational sale and we talk of deintermediation and direct to customer, and we're not talking embedding products, that's a different issue altogether. We're talking of selling insurance products direct to customers, you know? And this is precisely why it's not happening at the level that we felt that it can happen. Now, if this be the case, then how do we solve this problem is the next interesting thing. Now let's look at it. If we have to solve this problem, then fundamentally what we have to do is how do we shift conversation onto the digital platform? No. Now, if I can, if I see the way um, Alexa's or you no, know, OK Google or Siri, the way they are developing and the way they're coming up. In fact, um, I was in the Amazon headquarters once, and they told me that uh, Alexa has more uh, uh, marriage uh, uh, proposal than you can imagine. No, if conversations are shifting digital, can we get insurance sale? which is a conversational sale shift digital because till this missing link is solved all the attempt made to make a sale happen on a direct to customers like we sell a mobile phone or or an apparel is where the failure is happening you know this is the next you no know, beautiful problem statement solve which will again impact the industry across the world at a very very hyper scale level you know so I, I, I don't have much time, so I, I can go on like that. Fantastic problem statement to be solved and current times and tech, the way it's going is enormous. But I just take a couple of more points to talk about the impact that the industry has on the life of common people. I sometimes feel that we don't uh, relate or understand this. So let me give you an example. <laughs> Let's say, can we believe that because of insurance um, industry, no, because of insurance, uh, the average life expectancy of Indians would actually move up by uh, five years minimum. Okay, let me prove my point. Uh, we we saw the launch of uh, the Prime Minister uh, uh, National Health Scheme, no, uh, which happened a couple of years back, and the coverage is for forty crore um, Indians. Forty crore Indians. Uh, it's close to what about one third of the entire Indian population, you know, um, who are uh, below poverty line or just on the uh, borderline of poverty line. And the sum insured is five lakh rupees. And the tech which has been done is so phenomenal. Like, no, it is not that you, they are going online buying policies or uh, they they have uh, the ID has been no already is there. Um, uh, the coverage is already there. They just have to when they fall ill just go and uh, put in their a number and check that they are covered and there are five lakhs I'm insured. Uh, amazing use of tech, complete cashless, no paper. For 40 crore Indians below poverty line, can you imagine? We're talking of no paper, uh, straight through cashless cover, some insured, five lakh rupees in the remotest part of country uh, on the villages part. No? And, and then sometimes we think that insurance companies are not um, uh, into tech. No? I think the insurance company and government partnership uh, does phenomenal job. Let's come back. When you cover 40 crore people and you have a five lakh sum insured in their hand, suddenly you see the newspapers talking about a lot of um, health uh, 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 infrastructure coming up, a lot of hospitals talking of opening hospitals in areas where they never ventured before. Why? Because earlier it was not feasible for them. But now suddenly, because the money in the hands at the root level is something which makes opening of uh, hospitals uh, feasible, which makes uh, healthcare uh, at the remotest part of the country, uh, distribution feasible. And suddenly you see a spurt of health uh, initiatives and um, industries coming in the country. Did you notice in the past two to three years, there has been a sudden spurt. With money flowing down at the root and health infrastructure improving, the immediate impact would be on life expectancy of the citizens of the country. And that's why let's say, if we look at Japan, the expectancies were close to 90 years. 
And if you look at Uganda, the expectancy is close to about 40 plus years. The difference is uh, health infrastructure. And how did it happen? Just a combination of insurance and the government intention gets the life expectancy to move up by five years, at least for Indians. Let me give you a second thing which we are working on right now. You know? uh, if you look at suddenly uh, in the past three, four, five years, you have uh, floods happening every three, four months. You know, you hear of a cyclone coming up, which is not so. I think when I was younger, we hear it one in 10 years or so. But in a, in a year now, we hear it four to five times that this is happening. Okay, now how do you ensure that people uh, who are getting affected are actually adequately covered? Because if you have built up a uh, property, if you have uh, bought um, things from your savings, and that would be like 10 years of your hard labor, no, which you have put in and all this stuff, and one uh, fine evening or morning, one cyclone, it all gets destroyed. If you're young, it's good, you build it again. But if you are, let's say, close to 60, uh, would you be able to build it again? You become homeless suddenly, you know, of all these years of working, and, and how do you get it all back? Uh, maybe government uh, some kind of relief, but is it enough? Um, I remember in Jammu and Kashmir, in the year 2014, when there were floods, uh, we had 50% market share in the state. Uh, we paid close to 1,200 crores, and we paid 40,000 claims just in a couple of months' time. I don't think the government relief reached that kind of amount. Insurance companies uh, can contribute a lot. So one of the solutions that we're offering is a parametric solution, where if, uh, if uh, water or earthquake uh, or, or rains increase a certain limit, which is predetermined, uh, we, insurance companies, pay straight to the Jandan account, you know, just so it actually means that as the storm is getting over, the money is getting transferred to your bank account, which means that even before uh, the storm settles down, you have the money to rebuild. You know? It means that makes a difference to millions of Indians who suffer from that. Do we, did we ever realize that insurance companies in partnership with the government across the world make a difference to millions of people in the country? You know? In our case, billion. You know? Amazing industry. Do we realize that the insurance industry provides employment which runs into millions. It is one of the largest employment generator in the country. For a country of India size, where the insurance penetration is, is very low, I think it can generate employment beyond people's imagination at a hyper speed in times to come. Now, how does it do that? If you look at what the Prime Minister is talking about in terms of uh, distillation of taking tech to the villages at a hyper uh, speed, at, uh, at, uh, we're talking of cables, then what is the reason that we look for physical offices to be created? Why can't distribution be created, which is, uh, which is on, a, on a person's uh, phone or on a on thing? If claims been sent in 10 minutes time, if policy can be issued immediately, why do we have physical offices? The moment the investment of physical office is gone, it actually means that the employment generation and insurance penetration would boom. Can we think of what all can we do as a country, which makes a difference to people's life. And how does the insurance partnership work? I'll give one more example before now I close this topic and then move to the third one. It's simply, if you look at pandemic uh, in India and you look at the lockdown, why did that lockdown fail, you know, uh, to, or uh, could not curb the spread of coronavirus? One of the major reasons was uh, the migrant labor uh, shift happening. Uh, in the lockdown because they had uh, they had to go and uh, and we saw all those pictures and all the stories migrant labor movement happened why because uh, the factories um, could not afford uh, to pay uh, uh, their salaries once the uh, lockdown happened the production stopped and uh, the work in let's say whatever construction stopped so they had to go now the pandemic pool that we are suggesting to the regulator, the regulator has come out a dark paper, and that covers standing cost in times to come if the pandemic happens again. Will the pandemic happen again? Uh, if you look at the trends now, the expectation is in seven to 10 years time, you may have the next one. So it's not going to be one off. It's, it's like the floods now. Every year, four or five floods happening. There's something is going to happen. Now, if the next time it happens, and we have a pool which covers standing charges, the migrant laborers need not start moving out. The spread stops. Did we think that if we have problem statements, we make a difference to the country at this scale. We make a difference to people's life. We make a difference to your life. We definitely make a difference to my life. Even if you're not insured, because you're solving a big problem, which would take place in the country. No, so I think uh, 12:30 was my end time. Um, 
I can go on and on because I've been an insurer for a long time. I had the pleasure of uh, working for a government insurance company, then I had the pleasure of starting a budget insurance company as a founding employee, building a company which covers now close to um, seven, eight crores of uh, Indian population, has the largest distribution in the country, and building a phenomenal um, a company which serves uh, the country in the way it is generating employment. We're talking of generating one million employment, just a single company in times to come. You know, such a lot of work happens and it's an amazing place to be. The combination of tech, the combination of identifying solutions for massive scale, the combination of getting government on board can make a, such a difference to the country that you feel proud as a professional. Thank you very much for your patient listening. It was a pleasure speaking to all of you. Thank you, sir. Uh, I would like, like uh, so please tell us about the highs and lows of your illustrious career and what these experiences taught you. Okay, my high and low of my career. Now that's a very good question. So let me speak about the, the low and that was the biggest low which I can think of. Uh, I, I wanted to be a scientist you know, from very early on and I one of my ambitions was that I'll get the Nobel Prize for my country. You know? Because I was influenced by Mr. C. V. Raman, I, I was born up in Calcutta, and with my father, on the evening walks, I would pass the Jadavpur University. So Mr. C. V. Raman had worked, you know, and uh, my father would tell me with a lot of pride how he got the Nobel Prize for the country. So as a small child, I was very deeply influenced. I thought I'd be a scientist, and I also someday get the Nobel Prize for the country. So I studied to be a scientist, and then because one of my friends bought an extra form for this competitive examination for insurance, and he challenged me. I joined. I sat for the exam, did well, cleared it, and they said, "Okay, at a young age." You know, you're getting into the senior position. Why do you join insurance? No, let's see how it goes out. Uh, so I said, okay, no harm in trying before I go for my PhD. So I joined insurance and I liked it. Now my mother was totally against it. Uh, as I told you earlier, uh, people thought joining insurance industry means you're good for nothing. That was the era when I joined the insurance industry. And my mother said, if this is what you do, you could have done something better in life. That was, I think, in my career or in my life, from perspective of joining a job, the lowest point, when you see your mother you no know, crying because you join an industry and you think, okay, it's a short time, I'll leave this and go and become a scientist. But the industry really enthralled me for the reason I told you. I realized that, that I get paid to do good. I make a difference to people's life. When I would go and give a claim check and see the uh, tears of gratitude in somebody's eyes, I was so overwhelmed. I said, no, I'll stick on and be an insurer. Now close to 30 years I've been an insurer and I can say I'm immensely proud to be. Uh, the highs of my career have been um, very many different ones. I think if I go back to the era when I started, uh, computer was just picking up. We, we would actually have, and you guys would laugh at it if I tell you, a computer where we had to put a bootable hard disk to start the computer and another hard, no, sorry, a, a floppy disk, and there's no hard disk then, and another floppy disk to write the program and get things done, to become the IT head for some time. And then no, in today's era, we're talking machine learning, artificial intelligence, movement and learning different parts, meeting different industries, being a difference to right from power, pharma, to farmers, to crop, to cattle, to pig, to insuring satellites, to you name it. And the kind of learning I had, the kind of people I met has been phenomenal. So I would say for me, high has been every moment, but the biggest high was uh, creating Bajaj Indian Generations company as a founding employee and taking it to where it is as a force to be reckoned with, as a community to reckon with. And all the innovation that we continue to do with my team and the difference that they make to people's life is something which gives me a huge kick even today. 